Yeah. yeah, we found out. I don't think Larry's South Africa. He's traveling, isn't he? I thought he was away. Yeah. They were giving away yeah. stuff. You know. yeah. All right, so I'm going to have to ask the chair. I'm going to ask the chairs to please open their school committees. I'd like to call the region, Colonel Wilson Regional and Union 60 school committees to order. Maybe. Is that you or me? Who is? It's a really good question. Did you mind? I'm sorry. I would like to call the Boylston School Committee to order. And I'd like to call the Berlin School Committee to order. Okay. Very good. Um, first, what I'd like to do actually is just start off the meeting by introducing your new recording secretary. We have uh, Deborah Desai. So she is. Join, joining us, and we'll, we ask that you have patience with us as we go through some of our processes here in our meetings. But if you ever have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask anybody. Thank okay. you. It's nice to be here with everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. So um, I also would like to start by um, we have um, Chris Baker here from Synergy. And uh, I'm going to ask Chris if he could just give you some recommendations. And for the audience, um, who is Synergy? Uh, Synergy is an organization that actually came to our three schools to um, audit our safety uh, precautions and for the respect of uh, the security of our schools. We have asked Synergy not to uh, give full details about our reports for obvious reasons, but to come to the school committee and to at least explain what some of the recommendations would be moving forward. As you know, we're applying for some um, grants uh, in the safety and security system. This will be some of the items that we'll be proposing for our grants. We also have some capital improvement requests as well going to the towns for our safety and security. So, Chris? Thank you. Where would you like me to go? Right here? Absolutely. Good evening, folks. Um, thanks for the opportunity for us all to be able to work with, with you guys and the principals of your school. Um, it was a, kind of a long process. I know we, we would call these folks at different times and ask if we could come up to, um, to speak to them, and they took time out of that day. I, I'd like to say first off that as far as we do a lot of security audits for different schools and hospitals and colleges and, and businesses, um, and it's obvious that when speaking to all of your principals, all of you folks can rest easy. You have, you know, they have a plan. So each one of the schools that we went to, they were, you know, they were very clear on security. They knew what they were going to do in a crisis. Um, they knew the limitations because of their schools and the age of their schools, and they also knew kind of what they were going to do uh, and how to work around those limitations because of the age of the schools. Obviously, the principal with Tahanto has a little bit different. Uh, school because it's brand new and there's a lot of modern features in here, so you know that that's probably in a little bit better shape than the, than the two older schools. Um, three quick areas that I mean the the report that we did was a few hundred pages long. It's the book that I'm holding in my hand, so I I bore you with all of it. Um, but the three areas that I think are kind of crucial to, to to focus on, and we broke them down by individual schools to you know five or six key bullets for each school, but three big areas. Um, of concern would be uh, notifications, access control, and technology. And number three would be continual training. So when we say notification, the notification process that if there was an emergency in that school, how are we going to not notify everybody as quickly as possible? And that's a big key. Obviously, in the um, in the world of you know when we're talking about violent intruder or an active shooter situation, every second counts. So the notification. Um, there, are, there are notification systems out there, one in particular that we like and ACE actually had in the previous school up in New Hampshire they worked with is the, is the COP sync, which um, we like a lot because it's, it's a real time, it's very simple, it's a one button, you press it, it opens up a chat room, and then you're actually, people are typing in what they're seeing right in front of them. So as opposed to relying on paging systems that have to go through all the callers, it's it's instant notification. Hey, listen, I'm in the classroom. You know, I just saw somebody walk by my door. You can read that on your computers. You can read it on the smartphone. You can read it, and the police have it right, right on their cruises as well. So 
it's a it's a pretty slick program, and it, it definitely enhances communication and notification, and allows the schools to make the the, um, the quickest decision that they can in regards to safety. Um, the next thing would be access control and kind of technology. I, I group those those two things together. Um, Again, Tahanto, it's you know, it's a beautiful school. Access control, you have you know the, the buses out front, and the cameras, and what have you. The two other schools are a little bit older, and, and so you'd want to try to enhance that. And how could you do it? You could do it with fixed cameras over the exteriors of the front of the school. You know, perimeter cameras throughout the school, either card readers or key fobs, like Tahanto has as well. And I, I get it, like that's all expensive type of stuff. Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, I think you pick and choose some of the things that you want to try to implement and over a period of time, maybe you gradually get to a, you know, to a position where all the schools are kind of like Tahanto. Um, the, some of the schools need more infrastructure improvements than others. Uh, you know, Berlin, when you walk through the front door, you know, and then you'd be, you're able to just walk right into the lobby and then into the principal's office. The, the ideal, Entrance way that, that we recommend is you get buzzed in through the exterior door, stand in the vestibule area, you go to a window, you get greeted by secretary, receptionist, whoever that is, you get processed right through that window. Once you're properly vetted, you're given your ID, then you're buzzed into the school. Tahanto has almost all of that in place. I mean, there's only one window at that in that front vestibule that maybe could be reconfigured. And that would be, you know, that would be great. The person gets buzzed in. This is what I'm here for. The secretary or the principal or whoever kind of looks at them, vets them properly, and then allows them into the building. Um, the same thing with Boylston, with the exception that outside of Boylston, there is no camera. So you open up the doors, and there you are at the reception desk, kind of as, as a surprise. Um, you know, if those doors were locked, if that had an outside key, they were let in, again, properly vetted in that vestibule area then allowed in the school. And then Berlin is a different animal in and of itself, which has, would probably take significant infrastructure improvements to make that kind of trap situation. Um, so that might be a school that you might consider just having a dedicated greeter or somebody who's just at those doors you know, processing people as they walk in. Um, and then finally, the area of training. I think often probably the most overlooked, but in some respects could be the most inexpensive. Uh, because you know, I believe the school system you know has Alice. I mean, we do our own version of Alice: lock down, leave, live. The government has run, hide, fight. But everybody has some sort of training that everybody subscribes to. So that doesn't take any money. That just is constantly. If you take some of these recommendations, and as long as the, and I think it's the, the job of the principals to challenge all the teachers and custodial staff and administrators to know your room, know your area. I'm in this classroom, what am I gonna do if I get notified right now? Right now? My door doesn't lock, so I'm gonna to have to leave. Or I'm in the cafeteria or I'm outside in this cafeteria right there where it's wide open, I'm gonna to choose to leave the building. So just continual training like that, and that's probably, like I said, the, 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 the one that you can do most easily and, and with probably the limited, limited amount of resources and funding. But that's kind of, in a nutshell, the report. Certainly, the superintendent, I would imagine, could, you know, could supply you guys and you could thumb through the, the entire report. But that would be it, in a nutshell. Thank you, Chris. Does anybody have a question for Mr. Baker? Yeah, have you shared the reports with the local police departments? I was waiting to, with, through the superintendent, get the hair, but we'd certainly be more than willing to sit down with that. Yeah. So I have given... Um, copy to the Boylston police chief already, and the Berlin police chief, I still have it because I haven't seen him. Okay. So Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. How do these typically get funded then, too? Is it a lot of town resources? I mean, majority of mm -hmm. other grants, other ways to... All of those. All of them. Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody else? Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. I appreciate no it. Uh, next, we have the consent agendas. So if each school committee could choose to make a motion to um, approve their consent agendas. Do I have a motion for the region to approve the consent agenda? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> like second? I second. Any other comments? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Could I have a motion for the Boylston School Committee to accept the consent agenda? All in favor? 
Aye. Lord second. second. All in favor. Yes. Aye. <laughs> we'll get it. Fine, yeah. We got it. Hey, we're on a roll. Do I have a, a motion to approve the Berlin School Committee's consent agenda? Yes. Yeah, we'll I second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any petitions and audiences relating to items on the agenda? Okay, we're going to continue to the reports. Do we have a CPAC? Yes. So um, I think November and December are probably what you guys need. Uh, we've decided to purchase a yearbook ad, and that was taken care of. CPAC is also this year doing a single $500 scholarship to either a student from Assabet or to Honto who's graduating who used special education services at either Berlin, Boylston, or Tonto, um, and who's going on to college or vocational institution. And we'll have more details on how they apply for that at a later next report. In December, all three schools participated in National Inclusive Schools Week, and we really want to thank the principals for letting us do that and supporting it, and the teachers who supported it. The kids at the elementary schools did What Are Your Gifts, and they did pictures, poems, um, little essays, depending on the classroom. And here, the Hope Club sponsored a poster contest. Uh, and uh, we're also looking into a 5 by 7 postcard to use rather than business cards and brochures. Uh, the committee is still talking about that. Our January meeting is tomorrow night at 7. It's Basic Rights and Responsibilities, and Karen Molner will be presenting it, and everyone's welcome to attend if they'd like. That's it. Jessica, I'm not sure if everybody knows you. This is Jessica Meltzer, and you're the co-president? Mm -hmm. The Berlin co-president. I want to emphasize that, Jessica. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Where is tomorrow's meeting? Yeah, this one. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Normally it's David. Do you remember me? Okay. Um, for my report, I'm just going to be very um, short and quick. You've all had numerous times to uh, to read the uh, annual reports from Aspen Valley Collaborative as well as their audits. Um, the annual report shows that they are healthy um, in their financial aspects and their budgeting has been um, right on when they anticipated it to be. The audit uh, demonstrated there were some um, a few areas of identification in the audit of which, as the board, uh, we met and we discussed that with the treasurer in regards to why some of those discrepancies happened and what actions they were taking. So uh, I know that a lot of those areas were, um, have been uh, corrected and, and rectified. The Kellogg's donation, last time we had that discussion, we weren't sure where that funding was going to go. When I contacted the recipient, they actually stated that they wanted that to go into the music department for the revolving accounts. So that's where they um, wanted that amount to go from the Kellogg's. We have the Adams Scholarship recipient breakfast that we welcome all the school committee members to join us. And it will be held this year on March 3rd um, at 8 o'clock in the morning. And it's held here up in the cafe. So um, we welcome all of you to join us. And the one item um, that I also have here is the draft of the calendars for the upcoming year. So this is just a first read. It's not um, for a vote. I will say that we have asked for feedback from all of the teachers of the um, associations, and we received a few uh, comments. Uh, one association was concerned that we had to start um, the date so late in August, um, while two of the other associations didn't want to begin any earlier in the year. Uh, we had one association actually question the additional Fridays, and so we actually changed the professional development day um, in January from a Friday to a Tuesday. And the reason why there was an additional Friday is because of the November holidays. Changed that as well. In an elementary school, that impacts them because they're on a five-day schedule. Where at the high school and middle school, it doesn't impact them as, as much because they're on a six-day rotation. Um, and then Tahanto also wanted to know if we could have half days um, at the end of the school year for finals. So I know Diane and I talked about that with the rest of the administrative team. 
Um, we said it, it used to happen, um, but I think we actually, as an administrative team, I think we thought it probably wouldn't be necessary at, at this time for FY17 to necessarily have a half day um, rotation. If you have an actual half day as well, you, that means then if school is out in a half a day, you actually have to have additional uh, busing routes as well. Um, and so it, it also causes, I think, a little bit, um, I think parents also prefer the fact that the students still have the option to be able to stay here for the full day. Tom's nodding his head yes. So <laughs> I'm thinking, so we, we talked about that as an administrative team. We think we, we want to have a little bit more discussion, I think, um, about that. And then also, um, the, one of the reasons why we had talked a little bit about not doing that is because in the, this, we now have the sixth grade here at Tahanto, whereas years ago they used to do some um, half days at the end of the year, but you didn't have the sixth grade um, at Tahanto at that time. And there are some parents that are concerned even now to have some of their sixth grade students going home even after school at the end of the day um, and at the end of the year having them go half day um, for the, the last few days of school, we felt was probably not appropriate at this time. Um, so Boylston um, stated that they also would like to, um, would still like more time to review it. They hadn't really um, had all of their input at, the to at this time. So I'll find out more information from uh, Boylston, but they still needed a little bit more time for discussion. I don't know if the school committee has any questions. I know you'll notice that we did not propose um, the half a day uh, before Thanksgiving. We tried that for this year. Um, I commended the staff actually for their efforts. However, our student population was very low in comparison to the average, and that's what you were afraid of as a school committee. Um, you were concerned with the absenteeism on that day before, and that's what happened. So I did ask the school committee to try it for one more year, to, to try it for this year, and we would collect the data for you, and it showed that it was not feasible to have uh, for the overall. So that's where we are. So I don't know if anybody has any questions on the calendar. Just a quick question in that first week of, that school starts. Mm -hmm. So it starts on the 31st. And they go on the 31st and 1st, and then Friday's early release. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's typically what we've done um, in the past because it's the holiday weekend. Okay. Uh, this year you saw a little bit of a different impact just because um, Labor Day felt so late in the year this year that you didn't really notice it. That you didn't notice that as much. Mm -hmm. And we tried to follow this current year's calendar as much as possible um, in trying to prepare. Is there any interest in maybe starting a week early? Um, you know, I had thrown that out there with some saying that maybe if we did that, then we have the chance um, to, you know, push the end of the school year, not to the right. 20th, but a little bit earlier. Um, and what I got back from some members of the executive council is that they felt that the teachers wouldn't want to come back um, so early. What was the date we came back last year? Uh, this year we came back, I believe it was the 20, I think it was the 25th 24th. or the 26th, 24th. right? 24. So, so we couldn't. It would be the same day. It would be the same day that they the would day. be starting. So I feel like the 20th feels like it's crazy late. Mm -hmm. It, not taking into account snowstorms, right. and mm -hmm. it feels incredibly late. Yeah, I agree with you because yeah. inevitably you're going to get three or four snow days mm -hmm. at least. So you're you're really <laughs> out then. We can always We're in New England. Yeah. Right. Are the teachers okay. opposed to that? Or do you um, I didn't hear much opposition, except like I said, one association, and it was just a member speaking on his own behalf that he didn't know as the teachers would want to uh, come back, you know, that much in advance. But it would be the same time they came back this year. Right. I think it's a day earlier, isn't it? Um, we started it's the same, it's the same time. It's always you started school on the 26th? I looked. 
was, okay. It was the 26th, and then it would be, it was the 26th that we started, and then if we started at the same time, it would be the 24th. Okay. Yeah. Historically, it's two days. It would be two days earlier, just because of leap year. Mm -hmm. I think we should push towards that. So we would like to try it on the I think that like we Bring it back to them and see sure. if there's... Maybe it's really about you. You either pay for it at the beginning or at the end. Yeah. Just maybe a couple days. Like, okay. I don't know how the teachers would feel about that, but starting with students on Monday the 29th, and then one teacher's union comes back the Friday the 26th, and the other two come back Thursday the 25th. I don't know. It's a long I month. Think, I mean, yeah. it's four full weeks, pretty much, but... So that's, I think it's hard not to get all the way back to the 24th, just for Friday. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thursday, Friday. I don't know. <laughs> right. well, yeah, well, for, Berlin, for Berlin, and I know Tahanto's had the, the two days it had two because they totally appreciate that. Totally um, understandable. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see I don't it. Know. Really it. We're already in there as it is. I, we like that Friday just to say, you know, ours were set up yeah. here. So it would be a tw the start on the 24th is what we're... So then we would say the 24th instead? The, so that one group would come okay. the 24th, the 25th, the one would come the 25th. Right? Did I get that wrong? Did I say that wrong? Right. <laughs> last year, this coming year, are you indeed because of the way how Labor Day fell. Right. Yeah, that's why it seems so different. But it's always been the last week of August. August. And I think it's always been the last kind of Wednesday of August. And mm -hmm. we're going to use that Monday or Tuesday. Because it's late, it was so late this year, and it's kind of a little different this year, and that's why it seems a little off. But we still started at the same time. And the last because Labor Day, it, it really it yes. wasn't that we started differently. We always started the same, but it was right. Labor Day it was just later. That's right. the only change. right. Labor Day was the last possible day it could happen, right. and then for this coming in, what's also making it awkward is that last week of August is really only half a week. It's not the last full week. It's the last. Half week because we get some September days, right. there, so that's what's really kind of throwing it off too. I can throw it out there to the executive council and see. Sure, why not? I can see that there's two sides to yep, it. Yeah, there's two sides to everything. It's just looking at June twentieth and knowing that that really could be June twenty fifth or something. It's it's really, right. Well, well I, until June twentieth. I will 25. tell you that it's on really average. Average rule of thumb in New England, you say five school, five snow days, you're going till June 27. And last year we did that and then had to go back to what felt like a lot earlier because of Labor Day. So I think that the, uh, uh, the general spirit is, yay, we'll get a longer one this summer to make up for last summer. And then each year it's an adjustment, whether it's mm -hmm. an early mm -hmm. leave. Mm -hmm. Yep. But I'll throw it out there and bring it back. All right. Thank you. Um, next, um, Julie, could you speak on behalf of the OPEB? Okay, I know everyone wanted to hear some more about the OPEB. At the next meeting, um, we're going to have Adam Dupre from our legal counsel and someone from PARS, who is a um, consulting group that handles a lot of um, school districts' OPEB accounts, because we really would have to hire a consultant because there's certain rules that if you don't have someone managing it, and you have to put so much money, a lot more than we want to be putting in. So we need to find a group. And, um, PARS has worked with a lot of school districts. They've spoken at Mars a lot of times. So they're going to do a presentation kind of based off of our OPEB report. And then um, Adam Dupre has kind of focused on school districts and setting these up. So they're going to come kind of tell us what the next steps are and what our options are. So that'll be the next and I both heard them too, the consultants from PARS. PARS a couple yeah. times, right? Yeah. 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 So they're, they're going to good. They asked for all our OPEB report, and they're kind of running some scenarios based on our information. So they're going to come to our next meeting and present. Great. Great. Uh, next, uh, Scott Pashoyan could not be here uh, this evening. He was actually scheduled for our last meeting that we weren't able to have. So Julie's actually going to speak on behalf of um, Scott tonight in regards to the different facilities and what's been going on. Um, a slight overview compared to what Scott's actually been doing. The poor man has been working 24-7, I think. Probably a lot less than he has in his report, but I'll kind of go over some high-level stuff. A lot of what he's been doing is really trying to create a maintenance plan, try to move the district kind of from on a, working on an emergency basis for everything and trying to get do some preventative maintenance. And in all the buildings, really working on the security. Like we had um, Synergy come in today, he's really starting to get the process. We're going to get some of that stuff starting to be installed February break. Um, in Berlin, it's probably been the place he's had the most issues. Focus has really been on the heating system. 
So while we're getting the new boiler, which is going to be installed in June, they'll start in June. Um, they're working on the engineering plans now, but they really can't install the kids in the building. So as soon as the kids are out, we'll get that going. But there's been a lot of issues with the heating system, with the software, um, just getting everywhere in the building to talk to each other, um, some deferred maintenance issues with some of the local heating terminals. So he's been working to get the correct air filters in, correct airflow issues. But So he's been doing a lot of work over there just getting the overall heating system running correctly. The library roof issues, uh, he believes that has been completely corrected now. We haven't had any shh, cross our fingers. Um, after a lot of investigation, the belief is that the ice dam is really caused by lack of insulation in the ceiling. So they've done a whole lot of insulation up there and they're hoping that's going to correct this problem that's been going on for years. Um, they've also had some issues with some water getting into the building. Um, they've worked with the town DPW and did some ceiling and some drainage work outside and that's been resolved. Um, Boylston, there was some leaking in the library atrium. They've done some work to correct that. Working on some outdoor lighting issues. They had some water pressure issues. That, there was too high water pressure. It was affecting the dishwasher and some other things, so that's been corrected. And at Sahanto, we're still working on getting our permanent occupancy permit. Um, one of the big holdups there is procedures and policies for maintaining the septic system. We've had to do all sorts of testing, writing this all up. It needs to still be presented to the Board of Health, and that should be the last step to get that completed. Um, there's continued HVAC issues here. Um, He's been working with the manufacturer's reps, trying to get to the root of the problem, get additional training for the building management and preventative maintenance for here. And there's also been some problems with interior door, the door card readers here. That's finally been resolved, so Scott's been working on that. The first time since 2012, right? Mm -hmm. Since 2013? Right? First time? Yeah. <laughs> so he has been very, very busy, and I do want to thank um, the people in Boylston and Berlin, they've been extremely helpful with Scott, um, the, BT, uh, the DPW, <coughs> the select board, uh, the planning board in uh, Boylston with this building. Um, and it's been a lot of work and he's had to learn a lot of people and a lot of processes, a lot of work that's had to be maintained uh, that has never been maintained um, from with an expert on the site, and it's, it's made a big difference. So I know Elizabeth saying, "He's so wonderful. It comes right yes. down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's brought me heat in <laughs> 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 a dry floor." <laughs> right. So anyway, all right, Carol. Um, at the last meeting, there was one section that I had promised you as a committee that I speak on behalf of Carol and I completely forgot. So I've asked Carol if she could just quickly report out about the elementary uh, curriculums for sure. our schools. Sure, I'm just gonna do an update on uh, two of these in particular. The elementary standards-based report card. We did have a report card committee. Um, I think it's still in place, but we're gonna hold off on the report card revisions. Um, in talking to the committee members, we're really looking at the curriculum again for ELA and mathematics since we've done revisions with um, Envision Mathematics, the upgrade on that. And also uh, because we're going to go deeper into understanding the standards and shoring up our, our, our curriculum uh, before we move forward and make any changes to ELA and mathematics. We feel that we're, we're okay right now to continue with that report card for the following year if there's something a little more stronger and a little more descriptive in our, our next report card. So we are working on that for next year, working on the curriculum, and that's our plans for a PD. And then in writing, Greg Moan has come and gone, and we've been delighted to have him um, in fifth grade. He worked on rough draft, the, the students wrote persuasive essays to NASA about going to Mars. Um, Greg was terrific in the classrooms. He went to all fifth grades. And we had the fourth grade teachers involved in, in the classroom activities. They came in to observe. And he came back again on the 21st and did revisions on the student pieces. I watched him uh, not only use the common sense, have common piece that the students revised with him, but he really spent time with each of the students, looking at their own work and giving them tips on revising. So we're very grateful to have Greg Baird's 
unique opportunity since he is a New York Times best-selling author and very busy working on his next book with Bill Nye and Sonny so That was pretty cool. Any other questions? Thank you, Carol. Thank um, you. Next we'll have um, John, Ace, and Diane um, maybe just give a couple of highlights about your reports. The school committee has already received your reports and it has time has had time to read the reports. So if you just want to give a couple quick little no, highlights. You, you, don't read. you don't need to read the whole thing. <laughs> they, I, I assure you they know how to read very well, I will say. Which one? Carol wants me to mention PBIS, I'll do that. <laughs> um, and if you have any questions about the rest of the report, please feel free to ask. Um, and we've talked about this before, um, wanted to kind of rekindle the flame of PBIS at Berlin Memorial School. Carol and Nadine have been really helpful in terms of kind of harnessing some resources for us. Um, and so we, I think, we're ready to move forward with staff from Aspen Valley, um, and I'm trying to blank on the names because it's not in my report because it wasn't official when I wrote it, who will come in and do some very deep training with some of the staff at Berlin Memorial um, to reinstall kind of a, a new approach to positive behavior approaches. Um, and I'm really excited about it. So that's going to happen. The deep training will happen over the rest of this year. Um, there are six full day sessions that teachers will come to, and then the teachers will move out then and support their peers um, as we unroll this to the rest of the school in the fall. So it's a huge step forward for us. And it's a big one. Thanks, John. Ace? Yeah. Uh, well, since we last met, we have wrapped up the um, the new part-time PE position. Uh, Michael Chance has joined us and he's been you know, he's just been a phenomenal addition. I've heard positive responses from the students, from the teachers, and even I've received some emails from parents just sharing how excited the kids are on PE day and really uh, getting them active and, and having them enjoy it. So he's been a, a great addition since uh, we last met. The one other one I'd like to share is the food drive that we, we completed in December. Uh, a parent, Christine Bradford, brought it to my attention that the Boylston food pantry was getting low. Um, so I put them, I put her in touch with Beth Ann Defonso and Lorraine Sullivan, who worked with the um, student council. And in a week's time, they, they came up with a food drive that ended up culminated in over 1,200 items donated to the food pantry. It was amazing to see in one week the, the school community really rallied around the cause. And, if you, if you ever get the chance to go in and see the food pantry, 1,200 items is a huge impact on that. Uh, it, was, it was great to see, and it was great to, for our students to know that they were, they were making such an impact on other people's lives and also on local, on local affairs. So. Can I jump back in just for one thing? I John's truly, always going to have one more thing. I just had to always talk about it for Ace. It's probably just that I didn't go first. We both wanted to just make sure that we acknowledged our winter concert, mm -hmm. um, which was held here for the first time, thanks to Mr. Cesare and the staff here, who did a great job supporting us. Um, Sarah Richards and Catherine Denny did just an amazing job kind of taking kids out of their separate schools, which is where those events usually held, bringing them here, making them comfortable. It really worked well, even with other things going on, which I think is a tribute to the design of the building. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we thanked all of those people. It was a great night. It was. I know I've done it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Diane? I'd just like, like to highlight a couple of things in my report. Um, we have wrapped up our mid-year benchmark assessments. All students in grades 6, 7, and 8 completed the MAP testing. Um, and we are hoping our reports will go out, will be attached to Friday's um, semester one report cards that everybody should be waiting for eagerly. <laughs> um, so we have made it through half of the school year, um, as well as the high school students uh, in grades nine through 12 finished up their midterm exams um, on Friday, and we are well underway into second semester. This week, we um, actually today, there are dates, um, there was a change in the African Arts and Education Program. Um, those of you who have middle school students uh, today, they were able to participate in African drumming lessons. 
uh, today right here in the multi-purpose room and it was really, it was amazing, it was really cool. Um, and then they had an assembly this afternoon and tomorrow we will welcome Richard Sobel who is the author of The D Delicious Peace which is um, an interfaith um, harmony um, coffee bean harvest in Uganda and he wrote um, this book which will be turned into a documentary so he is doing a school-wide assembly for the middle school as well as the high school tomorrow um, and then our food services director Mary Ellen Freiberg um, in conjunction with um, some of the people from the African arts um, educational system is um, cooking some traditional African food here, um, which started today. I don't know if anybody had it. Did you guys have any barbecue pork? Okay. <laughs> 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 um, but there were, you know, there were, Is that a good answer? Okay. <laughs> they were uh, very excited about that, so um, a lot of things happening this week. Great. Thanks, Diane. Okay, so we have some um, business items that we need to attend to. So um, with the Berlin School Committee, we'll start there. There's a disposable um, disposal of surplus property as per policy DN and the utilization of DNR. Um, John and Paul, they looked over the items at all the schools um, and we need the school committee to actually vote to recognize this as surplus. Do I have a motion to recognize um, this list, right? The list noted here as surplus. So moved. I'll second that. Well, oh, oh, any discussion? No. So for those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, next is the donation for the after school program. Typically, by your policy, um, we um, have to have a recognition when we get uh, donations used for our schools. And the Boys Youth Basketball Association is donating $250 for our after school program um, supplies. So, we need a motion to approve the donation. So, do I have a motion to approve the donation? So moved. I'll second it. Any discussion? No. Thank you for the yes. basketball. Yes. Thank you very much. Really nice. Mm -hmm. So, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, the next item, Tom, is yours in regarding right. the community open forum. So, last year in February, we had a community open forum. Um, I think it went over pretty well, right? In which we had two topics and um, we invited people from the community. We had a pretty decent turnout. And I was interested to see if um, other members of the committee would be interested in doing that again this year. And if so, when and what topics do you think would be um, good? Um, I did go to the link meeting yep. earlier this month and I asked if anyone had any um, thoughts and someone did suggest um, enrollment, um, looking at projected enrollment numbers and kind of having a discussion about that. I actually thought that was a great suggestion. It was from the report that we had. It was one of their suggestions, as I recall, to kind of look at the upcoming enrollment numbers and maybe have some different scenarios. <coughs> so okay. that's one suggestion. Any others? I was the only one. The only other thing I can think of is when you um, did this before, it was really about, you know, a, a bigger, a, a big picture, right? Um, you wanted to get more input from the, from the community. And um, Julie and Angela and I met this morning with Mark Abrams from the Abrams um, group that's doing your feasibility study on the fiscal um, work. And we believe that he'll have this done probably like in April, right? I think that's what he said. By the end of April, he'd actually have a report ready to bring to you. So I think that would be another topic after the school committee has a chance to talk about it that you might want to do an open forum to actually have a discussion about that as well. I know it's a little bit later in the year yeah. than what you're thinking, but um, 
you know, just to have, because there'll be questions, and I think it'll be important for you as a committee to have time to talk about it. So I'm not so sure that I'm, I'm talking the same thing, but after the Abrams group actually talks about it, you as a full regional committee might want to have a workshop where you just actually have a topic, an actual conversation among each other as a workshop of taking apart this report, because it will be quite extensive, and to identify what you think is going to be important uh, from those findings. So you might even have to do, my suggestion might even be that the school committee actually yeah. have a workshop on that for the whole night where it's just that. I think that's a good suggestion. Yeah, that sounds I also, I think once that report, once the school committees had the opportunity to visit with that report, that we probably want to think about how that gets rolled out. Mm -hmm. And I know the select boards and finance committees would probably be extremely interested, maybe right. before we do a, com a public mm -hmm. or community forum. Mm -hmm. So with regard then to the open forum topics, any other for the Berlin reform? No, but perhaps if we set a date and we... Do you think we should have one? I just want to make sure. Yeah, are you guys okay with that? Yeah, okay. I think so. Perhaps if we set a date and we know we, there's one thing that has come up, then maybe one or two other things that get suggested once we know it's happening. I was thinking in the March time frame, which would be a little bit too early. Cause I'm, I think if we waited for the other one, we're probably into June, yeah. and then the turnout is probably going to be a lot lighter. You yeah. know what you might want to do as a suggestion is maybe um, if you want to formulate a survey, and then you know John or I could send it out to the families to see yeah, if you had an open forum, what kind of topics yep. would they like to see being brought forward? So you, you actually have something that's rich and topic. Okay. Tomorrow I'm having a um, superintendent's chat. Next week I'm having a superintendent's chat. I can ask them too. Yes, yeah. yeah, so that'd be good idea. Forums, so we can have some topics that they might want to bring forward. When are the budget hearings? Are they in March? March. March. Yeah. So budget would be a topic. What's that? <laughs> budget would be a topic. That's a topic. Budgets would be a topic. Could yeah, be. So no. that would be good. Could be. You want to talk about potential dates? Yeah, I think we should sure. at least get a date. Get some of that going on there. Right, because last year we did it, actually it was like, it was the Thursday before the winter break. So that's too close, that's next week. So we're definitely not ready for that. So I'm thinking sometime in uh, March. So the budget hearings of the week of the 21st, right? Yes? Budget hearings the week of the 21st. Yes. So do we want to hold it before or after? Before. Yeah. So if you were to do it, I, I will just tell you that um, Tuesday evenings and Thursday evenings I'm, t I'm taking a course and Wednesday evenings I'm teaching a course. <laughs> <laughs> so that's no Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Oh, Thursday. Um, but I have Monday available on the 14th. Uh, fine. I'm you guys good? I, I couldn't do that night, but okay. Okay. that's okay. You, you know, I think do it's, it out. No, I think it's important that we're there. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, so is it always Monday? Monday? What about the week before? Monday. The, I'm sorry? How about Monday the 7th, then? That is my superintendent coffee chat here at Tohanto at 6.30. Mm -hmm. right, so March is over. <laughs> Following week is the following week is Monday after Easter. That's STEM advisory board. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So next we are in April. What about Monday the fourth of April? That looks good. Because that's when the actual budget vote is. Is your budget vote on the what? fourth stem? No. I have something on the fifth. Yeah, yeah, that's what I have noted. Yeah. Yeah. Is yours on the oh. fourth? Oh, yeah. Ours is on the fifth. So okay, seven. yeah, yeah. I I just all of ours is on, I think. We're so if you had it on the fourth, the budget the vote hasn't happened. Yeah. Right, exactly. Or not. So April 4th? April. Angela? I'm sorry, April 4th. April 4th, okay. Yes. Oh, I see a problem. 
That's okay. Uh, what time? How early? How early can we do it? The earliest can be better. Six. Do you think that's a problem? I'm trying to think when we had it last time. It was probably seven, but six. Yeah. John, does that work for you? This does. Thank you for asking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Went you there. So Monday, April fourth at six o'clock. Yeah. Do you want to do six, six thirty? The earliest is better. Oh. Well, wouldn't a good birthday present need to come to our forum? <laughs> oh yeah, you, you know what, Angela? I think you can come. I, you know what? I'll have you his cell phone number. I'm sure he would love to do that. All right, why don't we say six? Six, six. it is. All right. And it'll give us a little time to work time. on some topics too. Yeah. Great, thank you. All right, super. All right, next we've got the Regional School Committee, um, the Fashion Club. This is a new club. Um, I'm actually just going to read the description of it for everybody. Uh, it's an official FIDM Fashion Club. It's a high school club sponsored by the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, a fashion college with campuses in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Orange County, and San Diego. Fashion clubs meet on their respective high school campuses at least twice a month and participate in creative activities, share ideas, learn new things, and explore their interests in the fashion <coughs> industry. Clubs choose their activities based on their interests, including fashion shows, workshops, field trips, and guest speakers, FIDM. Fashion Club is dedicated to supporting and mentoring students who want to pursue careers in fashion. There are over 800 FIDM fashion clubs in high schools across the country. Uh, Asinia Moraitis, is that how you say your name? A uh, grade 11 student is spearheading this club at Tohanto, and Lindsay Romales is has agreed to be the advisor. There are currently about 24 students interested in grades 6 through 12. I 100% support this fashion club. It's another opportunity of having students grades 6 through 12 together um, with some creative ideas. Yeah. So we need a motion. So moved. Do have a second? I'll second it. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Do clubs like this cost the uh, school anything? Is there any cost to the school? For the advisor. And what is that? Um, I believe it's either six or eight hundred dollars a year. So it's five hundred. Is it five? No, it's kind of, I don't know. It's either six or eight hundred. I don't know, but that's that's what the cost is. But what you know? Just We have it in the. You know, we have it. A, a set number in the contract. What usually happens every year really depends upon enrollment, whether a club um, runs or doesn't run. So every year we're, we're always very even. We never. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so it's the same amount. It's a, yeah. Like we have a club that's not running this year that ran last year, so that club can the cost for the advisor for this new club can pay for mm -hmm. that. So it was already in the budget. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, I wanted to bring forward um, a tuition uh, proposal for our Chinese um, students. We have a potential for students to be coming to our schools um, for possibly uh, two weeks at a time. Originally, this was for January and February, but we just want to open it up to opportunities in the future. Um, we are proposing $1,000 a week for tuition and that $200 a week for families who agree to board these students. And that's the cost that we would be uh, proposing to um, the students in China. I went through a variety of um, school systems and what they um, charge. I asked, our real, I asked um, Russ Dupre, our attorney, how this works, and he said, you really set your own tuition costs. Um, so I did the average in between. Of a variety of opportunities, so a thousand dollars a week for the tuition. Um, when we were doing our summer program, we were looking at sixteen hundred dollars um, for two weeks, eight hundred dollars a week. That was not a full, full five days of school. So, I'm just going to get a motion 
So I have a motion to approve the tuition for the Chinese students. Yes, motion made. Second. Second. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Great, thank you very much. Uh, next we have a student teacher, um, Paige, how do you say your last name, Tinsadi? <laughs> okay. Um, so she actually is from uh, WPI, and she is going for her initial mathematics license, and she will be working with Francine Gleason. So we need a motion from the uh, school committee to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. I'm going to your signature. And John, finally, oh, <laughs> finally, uh, I, I appreciate you waiting. Um, John is here to talk about the Pearl Harbor um, trip. We have gone to Pearl Harbor um, a couple of times, but this is a special opportunity to let John speak on behalf of this trip. I think uh, um, you guys were sent out, I think the itinerary and the cost of the trip, this is just something we like to go on with part of what we're doing here. All right, yeah, uh, my name is John Nush and I've been here for 16 years. And during this time, um, I've taken students on 10 overnight trips, okay, four times to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. I've taken them down to Washington, D.C. three times, down to New Orleans, the Grand Canyon, as well as San Antonio, Texas. And obviously, when we, you know, for us here teaching, uh, if you have an opportunity to present ourselves, to try and make a connection to what we are teaching in a classroom outside, of course, school and life, we try and do so. And that's why I think they have a great trip when they go down to the Cape every year when they're reading a book with Henry Besson, and they go down to where he actually, of course, wrote it, and they go to his you know, his, his, his um, society down there, the speaker, and it's just, it, it just adds to what we're teaching in the classroom. So I never thought I'd actually be asking to go back to Hawaii like within two years since we went last year, and it was, it was a great success. <laughs> right, John. So, you're supposed you to believe so. that. <laughs> um, but, you know, this past year, um, obviously Pearl Harbor is on December 7th, this past year I had a former student who was whose grandfather was actually a Pearl Harbor survivor, was on the USS Maryland, and came to the school about three or four times and spoke to the students. And she said, hey, you know, you know just here's a, um, a link to one of the interviews he had on WBZ. And he passed away about a year and a half ago. So and I, and I looked at it, I said, you know what? I said, what would be a great idea to actually go to Pearl Harbor on the 75th anniversary and bring history that alive to an historical event that is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because even though we celebrate things here in the United States, a lot of times you don't have people living from those events. I mean, we can go to a Civil War reenactment, we can go to American Revolution reenactment, but I would say there's no one there who actually can talk about who was present. So the last time we were at Pearl Harbor, there was two Pearl Harbor survivors, you know, there every day, as well as what's called two Tuskegee Airmen. They were part of the all um, black um, fighter squadron in World War II, and the movie called Red Tails came out a few years ago about that, and they were there as well. So the kids were in awe that actually talked to people. So what, of course, they're trying to do for some of course, is bring back as many as they can. Um, that, of course, makes them at the earliest age, 93, because they'll be either 18 years old and be the anniversary. And there's still seven survivors left from the USS Arizona itself. So they're trying to get as many as they can. So the impact I had last year, we went there, is as the kids were there, and they, you know, things you hear about, talk about, but you know, the last day we were there, the kids, um, as I mentioned before, they were sitting having lunch, and they went and bought the veterans their lunch and paid for it because of what they were so taken back by what they saw and experienced being there in Hawaii. So I just feel that this is just an event that you'd be a part of would be something that um, it's once in a lifetime and it'll be a lifelong memory to be actually so we are scheduled to be in my head i have a few brothers in the military to make sure we will be at pro Arbor on december 7th part of the ceremonies as well as the parades and some other stuff to commemorate that and all things you know there might be i think confused beforehand but the, what's different about this trip obviously is we can't control 
when Pearl Harbor took place, meaning December 7th, so that means we'd be missing school time. Of all the 10 little trips I've taken, I've always taken them on school vacations. I've never missed a school day. So that's why just part of the stipulations that I was talking with Diane about, all right, about students who actually uh, might be able to go, is they gotta follow these stipulations because we're missing school time. And one of them is they have to all be passing their classes for the first term as well as the second um, interim progress report. So if you are not passing, it doesn't matter if you have paid most of the trip or not, you didn't have ahead of time, you are not, you're gonna be asked to come off the trip because if you're not passing a class, you're not gonna miss like five days of school to, you know, on, on top of that. And also what we're gonna miss five days is you, know, you can't be in violation of your attendance policy that what we have here, like we have eight days. After eight days. For per, you know, per semester, then you of course are not gonna basically get credit for the class. So if you are in violation of the attendance policy, which is eight days, or the tardy policy, which is 12, 12, 12, then you again will not be allowed to go. So if you want, you understand this is a privilege to go, and they gotta follow certain criteria in order to be allowed to go. And if they want to go that bad, they will get here on time and do well in class as well. And the third one will be obviously they have to talk to their teachers ahead of time and say this moment, so what work can I take? Because a nice 13 hour plane ride, you can do plenty of work on the plane to and from <laughs> as well. Okay? So that was one thing that I also pass out that the parents will receive as well, is um, some stipulation to go along that I haven't had before because I've never missed a school day on any of my 10 trips. So that is what I'm asking to do for I mean, next December. And of course, I hope we have, have a December like this one where there's <laughs> no snow and to worry about flying out. So does anybody have any questions, concerns? I'd be happy to answer. I, I think it's great. I think the trip sounds great. And to me, I think there is a finite number of opportunities that these folks will still be with us on the mm -hmm. earth. And Correct. quite frankly, I think any opportunity we have to give our kids that, I think it is a worthwhile endeavor, and maybe next year, and your answer, because there will be a day when that won't be available. Mm -hmm. Correct, no, thank you. Yes. So, that's my feeling. John, is there any opportunity, it's a fairly expensive trip, is there any opportunity for parents to pay monthly, or yes, something the, uh, to break it down? Yes, what it is, is, um, I, I like this company because it's, it's actually, even though we, you could go to Hawaii basically for a week, the flight effort is included, it's still less expensive than any other trips that are kind of going overnight around here, actually. So what is the initial deposit? Um, I forget about that February vacation. And then there's a payment plan with the company. You just pay online per month, like March through, it will probably be like the end of October. Because like, 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 you usually like to have the full payment by about 30 days out. So and it'd just be like a monthly payment, like we all like bills, you just gotta have the bill to the monthly payment. <laughs> That's why I only have my kid bill, by the way. No one's paying. But yeah, so it's, that, so it's not like they all you know pay once or you get that you get that just have to here and have to here. It's just be broken up over a month and stuff. So, so if I calculate right, they're going to miss six days of school. It'll be fine. We will be flying back, and then we will be coming to school Monday. Monday. Yes, we will come. Yes, so that's those, part of it. So those five days that they miss, how will will that be absence for them? So if they miss three other days, will they? No, this is yeah, a school be, event. A school this will count. Sponsored event. Correct. So okay. It's, it's just like right. If someone say even we go like a freedom trail for that day, you're not missing school. You're not kind of get your attendance because it's just yep. a school sponsored event. So it will not count. If they have three, they still have three when they get back. And do we have any policy about um, trips like this happening during school? Nature's classrooms. Yeah, just yeah, the nature's classroom yeah. goes. In sixth grade, MASC, we don't have anything the student that. council goes for three days down the Cape. Yeah, I, I just say yeah. this is an extensive amount of right. time. Yeah, it's the same amount as what Nature's Classroom does. Mm -hmm. They've got to go for a week. So, again, I, I, I just try and go during because school vacation, I usually do February, April, but this is just sure. when the events are going to take place. So I just. John, the only question that I do have, and I'm sorry I should have asked this before, and not put you on the spot, so if you don't have the answer, that's okay. Okay. Um, 
just where this is not EF Tours, it's another company. Yes. Do you know what their policy is if the nation has a, um, a traveling crisis in regards to reimbursement? Should they decide not to? In terms of the crisis, no. I need, all people, of course, can get the trip insurance okay. with it, and they, of course, encourage that. But in terms of if we've ever had any kind of issue, no, but I can easily find that out. Yeah, just find out about that. I just I know what EF Tours policy is yeah. on all of that. I just don't know what this company is. Okay, yeah. I mean, I've traveled with these guys every time to Hawaii and other trips. This is like my seventh time working with this company. So, I mean, I, you know, I feel comfortable, but I'll, I'll be happy to email them and I'll let you know. Yeah, just ask so. them what that is, just in case. Okay. It's always good for any company just mm -hmm. to know what that is. Oh, sure, absolutely, yeah, I'll, I'll email them tomorrow. I should have asked you that. No, no it's all right, I'll, I'll be happy to email them tomorrow and see what they say. I have a couple questions. Yeah. So if somebody falls out of good grace and standards to be able to go, is that part of their tuition when they're paying it, that they can they are reimbursed? Yeah, they're reimbursed. Yeah, they're reimbursed. That, 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 that what they're doing. Should almost be required by everybody to pay for the insurance. Being right. I mean, I can kind of suggest that. I would, you know, suggest that, but they know hopefully going in. That's why I give these letters and commission slips, and they realize what they get themselves into, and they have to follow certain things in order to get from here to there. Or you have your child pay for the insurance portion. <laughs> I don't know if it's like an extra hundred dollars or hundred twenty dollars or eighty dollars. I mean, it's not you know. Well, it's, but it's yeah. It's right. Them accounts. Do we do encourage that? Most do encourage. I think last time about half of them. If I look at it, because I mean, because I of course will have like the access, you know, being a tour, you know, coordinator, so I can see who has it stuff like that. You know, but it is definitely recommended because you never know. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the trip company? Uh, it is it's Gateway Music Tours, based out of in, um, Minnesota. I mean, does, does, does attendance to one like trip preclude or exclude somebody? Like, I mean, can they go to all the trips if they have the means and, and ability to do so? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's curious. Lots of opportunities here. No, I mean, a trip. Especially if they keep the academic standards up and they fulfill their obligation right. to create the life lesson in addition to the lesson. Yes, that's what that's right. You tell part you want something to say it's bad, then there right. is a cost involved as well as responsibility. So I just want to thank you because it's really great to have teachers like you that are willing to take kids on these sorts of trips. So thank you. No, I enjoy it. No, thank you. It's 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 great. I mean I still see students I, I I mean, it's 16 years. It's like everywhere I go, I definitely bumped into a Toronto <laughs> graduate. You know, it's great. And they just bring up, like, oh, do you remember this? So, I mean, it, it, I've been doing this since like 2001, so it's, it's great. So, I, I mean, thank you, but I, I, I really do enjoy doing it. So. Talk to him after February vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get to work down there. <laughs> I'll be fine on to work. <laughs> making bricks. The house might collapse. I mean, like, <laughs> we leave in two weeks for the Dominican show. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So. Right. Any other questions? Honestly, any other questions? I'll be happy. Okay. Okay. All right. So, do I have a motion to approve the Pearl Harbor trip? So moved. Second. I second it. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Great. Okay. There you go. So much on that. Okay. Um, next, what uh, we had brought up a topic about DESE and the assessments and PARC and ESSA and um, what you had received in your packets would have been some more information that the Department of Education um, provided all of us in regards to ESSA. Um, I think I forward all of that to all of you, as well as the park. So just to give a little um, background, MCAS will continue with science for grades 5, 8, and 9, or 10, depending upon um, which grade they take, the high school biology. And um, also grade 10 for ELA and math. That will continue for the next two years. Um, and then MCAS will be gone. We'll be doing... Um, 
well, I should say the original MCAS will be gone, right? That's what I should be saying. Uh, Park, we're going to continue to take Park uh, online here um, for all of the other grades, just as we completed last year. We're no different um, than last year. They're all going to be online, and Paul's been working with the rest of the admin team on uh, making sure we're up and running, and we'll be ready to, to go with that. Um, we actually didn't see um, huge issues with that in our school system um, overall. We, we were able to handle the, the expectation of that with the park and, um, and all the online systems. So we're feeling very confident with where we are. Um, we're also going to continue um, to provide ELA instruction uh, online in regards to their assessments. What we started to do last year was grades three, four, and five at the elementary school. They would do their um, unit assessments online, so they would get used to it. And uh, in February of the students' second grade year, they started doing it. So when they started in the fall this year in third grade, they already were familiar with the process. Um, so we're going to continue that same piece for this year. So for students in grades three, four, and five, this is their second year of instruction on the uh, unit assessments online. Um, but I just, one of the things I just want to clarify is we're not teaching to the park test. Um, it's an instructional strategy that we're teaching students um, how, to, how to be assessed so that they're comfortable um, but the instruction itself, the content, and is all in alignment with the standards. So it's the standards that's driving it, not the test driving the standard. Um, there's a difference of philosophy on that, but that's how we really feel, um, strongly believe that. Also, um, for our math program at the elementary school, we did um, upgrade our Envisions math program, so there is an online component and they have started to utilize some of those uh, different capacities um, at different grade levels. So we're starting to get students a little bit more familiar with understanding um, the mathematical procedures on, on the face of the computer. Um, so we're comfortable with that, I think, at the elementary school. We're more comfortable even this year than, than we were last year with it. We know what to expect. Uh, the governor has decided to have a next generation MCATS. Um, and um, so I'm going to leave it at that because I could <laughs> say a few things about that. But um, overall, we're going to start uh, beginning that administration in the spring of 2017. It is an online assessment. Um, there will be a combination of MCAS-like questions and PARC-like questions um, on, the, on the assessment tool in accordance with uh, the commissioner. So um, I think... That's it in regards to MCAS Park, yeah. Um, so one of the things that, that did get brought up is is there a question? There were some questions about opting out. Um, that was a big topic of discussion for last year, and I just wanted to reiterate to people that on the commissioner's page, um, on the website, in accordance to Mass General Law. Chapter 69, Section 1I, it requires that all students who are educated in Massachusetts public funds participate in a statewide student assessment program under the direction of the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. This requirement was first enacted as part of the landmark 1993 Massachusetts Education Reform Law. The statute does not contain an opt-out provision for parents to remove their children from participating. In short, participation in the statewide student assessment program is mandatory. So I just want to be clear that that is from the department. And I'm just the messenger reading the message from the commissioner directly. Um, so for the spring of 2015, the board had given districts um, the option to administer one of two tests the MCAS or the PARC. <clears throat> and it also states here that both tests will be used to report student level results <coughs> and to evaluate school and district performance. Students are obligated to participate whether the district has chosen MCAS or PARC. Um, again, I'm the messenger and I'm just reading from the commissioner's page. Um, ESSA is our new, our new uh, race to the top 
no child left behind, education, um, and, and so forth for student awareness. So what we want to um, make sure is that we are abiding by the new rules. And I believe I gave you Doug Williams, who's our former attorney. I think I gave you the handouts as well. Uh, Ken, I don't know if you have this in your packet. If not, I can give this to you at the end of the meeting. Um, but it's really about um, the new ESSA, which is the federal, uh, the new federal uh, Every Student Succeeds Act. Some of the differences, um, it talks about the student testing and district accountability for grades uh, three to eight. It's a, that's a continuation. Um, what it talks about, the main differences here, um, the main points was about the assessment, the teacher evaluation. Is saying that um, you know the, the requirement is now left to the discretion um, in regards to the standardized test scores. Um, as a federal level, and I think this is where a lot of confusion came from um, in a lot of teacher negotiations in, in the Commonwealth, um, was that the ESSA works a significant change from the No Child Left Behind in the area of teacher evaluation. Um, there's no longer a federal requirement that evaluations be based on standardized test scores. However, um, it's left to the discretion of the state. So, of course, Massachusetts has stated that Department of Ed will retain the available statewide assessments as one evaluative measure. So, although some states don't require it, Massachusetts does still require that in a teacher educational evaluation. Um, the federal funding has changed a little bit in how they're prioritizing their funds. Special education, um, there's been a few changes um, in that area. So states must report the four-year graduation rates for students who take um, tests that receive um, alternative diplomas as well. So that's one of the requirements. And also they mandate that we report plans of reducing bullying, harassment, and physical restraint and suspensions. We've already been required to do that. So in many ways, we're, we're ahead of the federal law. We've, Massachusetts has already uh, required a lot of these requirements. So um, Ken, did you look in your packet? All right. I, I can get this to you at the end because I have copies of it anyway. Um, so that's really the update of all of those changes. Um, I will say, and I, I know I talked to you about this um, in a previous school committee meeting, we are we are pleased overall with our scores, with our PARC and our MCAS scores that we had for last year. Um, however, you cannot compare, or I believe, and I think many concur, you really cannot compare our scores to other districts on an even um, level throughout all of the uh, 312 districts in Massachusetts because some people chose MCAS, some chose PARC. Even on the PARC assessment, if you compared yourself to others on the PARC, some chose to do it online, some chose to do it paper and pencil. So there was not an equal playing field, if you will, in comparison. So what we've chosen to do as an administrative team is to look at our students of where they were last year and where's the growth and where do we need to work with them. So that's really the route that we've taken. It's more of an authentic in-house approach uh, to assessing those, um, those scores. Anything that I missed or anything that my admin team wants to add? No. Do you have any questions, Lori? I just um, one of the things that I read recently is that the folks in Worcester have successfully secured 80,000 signatures to put on the ballot to abolish Common Core. And uh, there's a legal challenge to it right now because I think they're saying it's not constitutional to mm -hmm. do it as a, a ballot item. But it's really concerning um, because there's no alternative. What happens if Common Core is voted out somehow or through a ballot initiative is there's a mandate to abolish or get rid of Common Core. What do you go back to? What standards do you go back so to? So if they decide to get rid of the Common Core on a federal level, there's nothing to say that the state of Massachusetts wouldn't keep it as an adopted 
This is Massachusetts. I know. Yeah. I know. But, it, you know, I think that um, with the Common Core, as a, as a superintendent and many superintendents have taken a stance that we think that that story's past us now. We have so much curriculum that we have been working on the last, well, for the last four years I've been here, um, you know, on the Common Core. We now have the science frameworks that we're, we've been working on and building that to do that would only bring us in reverse mm -hmm. of the progress and the gain and the work that all of our teachers have done. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're really not in support. We don't see where that is a positive benefit for our students at this point. Um, so I know, that, I know that those superintendents have made that stance, that the Common Core is really where, you know, that's where we are. There's always room for revision. There's always room for changes and so forth. I think we have to keep in mind that the Common Core um, really looked at the Massachusetts framework. Uh, when that Common Core was developed um, and we were used more of a guideline. And some of the states that really uh, chose not to adopt the Common Core, I don't know as if potentially there was a large gap uh, with what they were previously doing to what they were doing now. Our biggest change that we saw in the Common Core is the fact that we were able to actually go more into application and implementation of skills rather than trying to hit all of the skills, we could go deeper in the skills that we were trying to produce for our students. So that's why it's, it, we were saying this, this is a better thought and it's a better process. So, And there's always going to be pros and cons of every, of every conversation, and there'll be pros and cons even among educators of how we feel about that. But this is what we've been working on. This is what numerous hours, weeks, months of years of conversations now that we have had with the Common Core. Depending on where this goes, I think it just may mean that we have to do some advocacy around mm -hmm. this issue because there are, obviously, there are like 80,000 signatures. There are people who yep. may not understand the scope of what I would say there's more people that are misinformed on me um, and I think they have a misperception of Common Core. Um, sat in even at Boyle's men's breakfast. Remember that, Angela? Well, I wasn't there, but I, I did hear that you and Carol did a nice job. And so <laughs> I was going to say it's like an open forum topic because you're right. I think people get caught up kind of in the politics of it and they don't really understand what common So it's so just a little bit more advocacy on informing people. Yeah. Yeah, and I think to some of the um, flyers that are out there that people are reading, there's a lot of inaccuracies to the flyers, and it's, it's a shame that people are being misinformed on a topic. So, good, good pros, good uh, comment. Thank you. So regarding the testing, it looks like the only thing that's going to change for us in our districts is in 2017, mm -hmm. having this kind of consorted... MCAS part new assessment, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, sorry. If, <laughs> if it's okay with the committee, um, I do know if there's a teacher that has a question, if it's okay. Sure. Yeah, I just, because I get very little information, because uh, um, most of the discussion is around math and ELA. Um, have they actually adopted the science standards yet officially at the state level? No, they haven't. Okay, so is there um, a next generation science MCAS or that won't happen until they adopt and Not yet. then it's going to take That's multiple right. years right. out? That's okay. right. That's what will happen. And um, right now I was just actually, um, I was just asked to be on the Commissioner's Civics Task Force for the Civics Framework as well as from Massachusetts. So um, I will be starting that um, in the next couple of weeks um, on that. And so I'll be picking John's brain on the civics task force frameworks and, and Steve Pacheco as well. So um, trip to Hawaii. A trip to Hawaii. <laughs> Absolutely. So anyway. Um, all right. So that one will be take, that'll take probably two to three years before that even comes out as well. 
Um, next is the school committee handbook for discussion. Angela, you wanted to talk to the committee about this? I just wanted to put it on the agenda just to remind you of it. This is um, an ongoing project, and you all have it as a Google Doc. So if, as you're going throughout the course of these um, couple months, you think of something like, oh, I, I think that should be in the handbook, then just add to it and use a different color font. Um, the purpose of this is just to help new school committee members with the learning curve. Personally, uh, and if you see something in there you don't think is necessary, just make a line in red. I don't really think we need this because the more concise it is, it's probably the better. Um, the only thing that I'm hoping to add is some more information on budget and things like that. Other than that, I personally don't have anything else to add to it. And I probably will bring it back up again in May. And um, okay. like to approve it at the end of the school year. So I'm just kind of asking your feedback, particularly from the newer um, committee members. If you learn something and go, oh, that would be nice to know a little earlier on than two yeah. years in. You know, yeah, I don't, have, I don't have anything to add today. But I, I have, I said I had a chance to go over Canada. Yeah. And it was an open section for both and folks. So I, uh, yeah, I did see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like maybe we should develop um, at least some uh, yeah. outlines. Yeah. Yeah. And only if there's something that okay. Boylston does different than the region, they have a certain, mm. you know, some, I don't know, you know. For example, Berlin has a scholarship that we have to do. So there's some information about who takes care of that scholarship sort of thing. but. Unless it's different than what you do for the region, you don't have to add something for Boylston specifically. Okay? So that's Thank it. Thank you. Okay. Um, the final topic tonight is the um, central office location. I wanted to bring this forward to the school committee. We have been talking about central office location. I don't really want to say it for a couple of years now. Um, and so there's been a lot of work that um, I've done probably couple of hours anyway every week that I've been doing so that school committee does not have to. Um, however, I wanted to just forward a couple of things. I wanted to bring you up to date of what's been happening. And second of all, I would like um, an advisory from the school committee of how you believe I should go forward or what the next steps are or not go forward. Um, but as you know, we've been in our, and, um, we're in our second contract currently at central office. Um, there is some work that needs to be done in order to maintain the quality of that um, office. And so we have been looking at the potential of moving into the golf house. I have met with um, Michael May, the select board in Boylston. He and I and Marty McNamara went to Assabet. And we met with all the department heads in, at Assabet uh, Technol uh, Technological School because they are um, potentially going to do, the students would potentially do the finished work and, and so forth in the golf house. I have also met with Craig Whitaker, who's the architect that the historical uh, society has hired for their project so far. We've gone over the plans. Currently our central office is 5,100 square feet and they would be looking at proposing that we go into a 3,300 square foot space. Um, it's quite a bit smaller than what um, we have now. We are trying to make that work. Uh, originally, we, I walked through that building, I was told that we would have the back half of the first floor and then the entire second floor. That's gone back and forth through discussions um, and as it stood with um, the historical society, I would have the entire upstairs. The back half on the downstairs would be theirs, but I could um, I could sign up to have the opportunity to utilize some of that office space um, if I had a meeting or I had something like that. The issue then became that we have 59, 59, 69, 59 file cabinets and they had a location for 25 um, file cabinets in the space, which meant that we would then have to take about 30 file cabinets or so, 35 file cabinets and bring them into the basement that historically has had water, um, some flooding. However, we were um, trying to find spaces of making it work. Um, we have also um, 
met with, after I, I met with everybody at ACIBET, um, I was then asked if I knew of anyone else, and I know of um, a gentleman in Boylston who is also an architect, so I gave him a call, and he came and looked at the space as well. He has tried to um, speak to um, Michael May, and I'm not sure if they've ever been able to connect or not because Michael was out traveling and then he came back, and so I haven't been in touch with Michael at all this week yet to see. Um, however, we've also, uh, Julie and I have also been talking about the potential of maybe utilizing some of the space in Boylston Elementary School as well, and we want to bring that forward. So the architect and I were supposed to meet this past week, but he was sick, and now he's gone for the next two weeks. So when he returns, we'll be looking at Boylston Elementary School as an option to bring forward to the committee as well. Um, there are a lot of people involved in the golf house, and it, there's a lot of conversations there that are being that are happening. Um, but I want to just state, and very openly, I have stated already to uh, Marty McNamara as well as to um, Michael May directly. It's at a point where I feel school committee needs to step in to state where do you want us to go, what would you want us to do. I know we don't have the answers yet at this point. I'm still getting more information for you, but I feel as if I'm becoming a middle person and I'm actually getting uncomfortable uh, with some of the conversations and where they're happening and I don't feel this is really my place. Um, I feel it's a school committee's decision of where you want the central office to be located. So I'm more than happy to be the messenger and get the information, but it's not up to me to be the decision maker of what's the right or wrong location or the right or wrong step. So that's where I am, Matt. So when does the, I think I asked this before too, but when does the current contract expire where we are? It's. It's, I think it's 2019 or 2020, okay. right? Yeah. It's 2019 or 2020. But now is the time to be thinking about it because whatever you do, if we decide to do move, say, into Boylston, it's not like we can make the decision now and be there in the fall. There's work, there's money that needs to go into it. We have to figure out how does that, where does that come from. I've also had a few conversations directly with MSBA because there's statement of interests are now starting to open up um, where you can put in proposals. And um, they have um, stated very clearly to me when they call me back that the MSBA funding is for K to 12 educational purposes, not for administrative purposes. So the funding does not go towards restructuring an elementary school for the sake of an administrative office. Um, it goes through for restructuring or reconfiguring an elementary school for an elementary school right. educational purpose. So. Can you get out of your current contract without any penalties? So there's an 18 month is what it states unless of course they can rent it in some other fashion. And how much is space is available at Berlin Elementary? There really isn't. We've looked at Berlin Elementary. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm oh, at Boylston. Yes. So um, Ace and I Same kind thing. of went through. Uh, we think that there's some potential. Um, you know, they had three classrooms per grade level um, all the way up to kid, uh, sixth grade years ago. And they also had a preschool classroom there as well. They currently no longer house the preschool classroom. And they are down to... Um, two classrooms for K, one, and two. Next year will be for K, one, two, and three. And that'll continue going to four and five. So five, they have a lot less classrooms six. than what they used to use. So what, three, four, five, six, seven less classrooms, but they've also increased in a lab. So they yeah. use one for a science lab. And um, some of the small rooms that were individual um, special ed teachers, special ed teachers have now utilized the classrooms, but we can still move um, some of those classrooms around and we feel as if Ace and I feel comfortable that we can make that work at Boston Elementary School, um, but we need the architect to come in and actually look at the infrastructure to see if it would make sense. Based on where, where you're currently at with the goth house and all that, what do you think in best and worst case scenario of how long it would take for them? 
that to really go? Because it seems like it's been dragging on for a long time. Right. Um, part of the issue is the funding, knowing how much it's going to cost and where's the money coming from. And um, oh, they don't even have funding yet for. So that funding, actually, what they're looking at is um, there's a potential of an outside resource that would be able to provide some um, funding for it, uh, but not for the entire project. Um, However, if you talk to this person, they think it's going to cost this much, and this person thinks it's going to cost this much, and this person says, I have no idea. So that's where a lot of the confusion is at right now at this point, um, is a bunch of figures going out there. And it's a little so there's bit no bigger. committed funding for that? Correct. I don't know if anybody's rehabbed an old house, but my fear is when you go rehab an old house for a new occupancy, it is as cheap as you think it is, oh, that's and true. you do not get the functional space that you hope for. I, 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 that whole thought to me is just instills fear. The whole thought of moving into that building, I don't think that's the option. I mean, my opinion, I just don't think that's the right. You're also, we're not laughing. I'm trying to think the right way to put it, but it's like laughingly aging gracefully, and you want to downsize. I don't think that's where we're at. I don't think we need to be moving from a facility that's you're using functionally, size-wise, and remove a third of it. I just don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think that's a path that we should probably abruptly stop on. Mm -hmm. um, and again, one resource would be the elementary. If there's, I mean, if there's seven, I don't know what the square footage of that would be. But what does six or seven classrooms enable us? Well, we're, the way we were kind of looking at it is um, some of them are actual smaller classrooms that could be utilized as office spaces anyway. Um, and then so one of the entrance ways we use is a storage space. So again, we're, I think we were looking at even three or four of those classrooms, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what we were looking at? Yeah. Um, would be equivalent to what? You have now. Mm -hmm. I, 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 mean, it's, I don't know if it's a permanent facility either. That's the question, right? But it seems like a Right, but it would be something that could at least place. sustain you, I would think, for probably Boyle's six or probably seven putting up years. A new building. Right. <laughs> Anytime soon. So well, there's a beautiful development going up on Perry Road. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're looking for kind of thoughts or recommendations, mm -hmm. my recommendation would be I think it's worth to do exploratory into the potential at the Boston Elementary. That would be my thought. At least it would be. Yeah, I think you need some alternatives. I, I think you've tried with um, good faith of going after the goth house for a long time now, and it doesn't really seem like it's gone too far. And I get that your current space, um, you really got to make an investment in that soon, right? That's, so I think we, it, it's good to start exploring some other options, I guess is what I'm saying. And mm -hmm. Boylston Elementary is one of those. I think we really should mm -hmm. dig into it. Well, what Julie and I were thinking about and why we were initially thinking that is you have to heat that entire building to begin with anyway. It's being heated. So, and part of it isn't really efficient use, right? So we're still heating it, but we might not be using a classroom or it's being used sporadically. And so we said we have to heat that anyway. Right now, it's about thirty-three or $34,000 a year where we are. Um, and so this would eliminate, some of that could help to offset some of the costs. Um, we see a cost savings potentially in the long term um, of maybe just going into one of the buildings that we currently have. You know, and, and we did talk about the golf houses. I think it's, it's an exciting opportunity. It's an opportunity where we can have the historical society, you've got the Vogue school, you've got the public school, we have the town. Everybody's all working together. It's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting opportunity. The reality of that, I question, is, the, is what are we actually going to be able to have for space? But I also question, um, you know, what about the maintenance of the building and how's that going to be maintained and kept up and whose responsibility is it at that point? You know, there's a lot of unknown questions there for us. And, you know, does the golf house and the historical society maintain the building? Does the town do it? Is it something that we have to do? Is it a combination? And then who do you call when something's happened? Or so, and, and what is the cost of that to maintain an old building? 
I don't know. And we already have a building that we have to be maintaining right now that we could just be in if, if, it, if it works. There are some other ramifications to abruptly discontinuing the conversation about the golf house. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'd be in favor of doing that as far as just stopping. But I think what I hear you saying really, I guess, is we have to pursue multiple options that make sense for the school, for the school department. Yeah. Um, I guess one question I have for you is what's helpful for you at this point? I mean, part of what certainly we would expect we would do is at some point have maybe two proposals presented. Here's what it looks like at Goff, and here's what it looks like at BES. And, and we make the decision. But I'm, I'm also wondering if you're feeling like you'd like some help now, even within the negotiating process with that complex kind of thing that's going on. Yeah, I think what would be helpful for me is if I had even one point person on the school committee that could actually just help me in what's putting together a framework. Let's say here's a timeline. We want to look at this. And we, you know, what's the anticipated timeline of a project to be finished? What's the cost of this? What's it going to cost the school? What's it? You know, what? You know, I, I think I just would like to work with a school committee member, and then mm -hmm. me and that particular member could just come forward to the full committee and say, you know, just objectively, these are the different scenarios. I just, it's, it's taking a lot of time, it's taking a lot of thought, it's taking a lot of energy, and I just think. Would Scott be able to help out with that too? I mean, I would assume the facility. Scott can help out with it, but right now he's so, honestly, he's very overwhelmed with everything okay. that's going on right now that I think I could, you know, confide in him in, in talking about some of the pieces that are going on. But I've really been trying to do this without having to bother Julie or Scott okay. because it's just, they have so much on their plate right now themselves. Um, I think Scott last week probably worked 70 hours, you know, at Berlin Memorial. I mean, he, didn't, he was there all weekend, even the weekend before. So just to make sure that they had heat in the building because they only have one boiler up. So, you know, there's just been and troubleshooting and yep. having one of the water pumps go down when you need yep. two water pumps and working with that and getting that. But it's just, it's never ending. I kind of agree with Lori about keeping all your options open. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't really know from the historical society what their benefit is of having a, a person that, a, entity in that building, would that allow them to get some of these funding and grants more easily than not having just restoring a old house? Right. And then, you know, how much do they need someone to move in there or not? And if they really need someone to move in, maybe they would. Yeah, I've been trying to stay out of all of those discussions because it's really not my business. So I've been trying to, you know, keeping that with between the town and the, and the golf. Historical Society. Um, all I do know is that they their lease is up in I think the end of June or the beginning of July um, is when their lease is up where they would have to renew their lease um, for that space. So I don't really know anything other than that. So, but to me, it sounds like the elementary school is the best bet if, um, if that works out. But, and, you know, I, I have openly, like I said, I've had open conversations, uh, Marty McNamara and Michael May are the two that I've been really in touch with in this. And I did explain to them that we were also exploring the option at Boyce Elementary School and the fact that it's actually a, a cost savings for the school system, you know, if, if it does work, it, it potential cost savings. We don't know all that for sure, but, you know, because we don't know how much it would cost to renovate the area. I don't, I think it may be a good idea for a school committee member to sort of participate and help with that process. I don't know if there's anyone here who wants to raise their hand and volunteer for that. 
I'll support the process. It's, I, I, I don't know if I would be willing to say I can commit a, you know, 100% to it right away. I just kind of see what happens, but I'd be more than happy to, okay. to, you know, with your guidance to get involved in the discussions. Great. Kind of, kind of set me down the path a little bit, and then I don't want to be non-committal, but I, I don't also, if I suddenly realize it's going to take a huge chunk of time, um, I'm just, I'm thin right now. So. Well, you know, that would be I great. Know, and I know we all are. I'm not that. I can show you some of the work that we've done. Yeah. Maybe, you know, we, I can have Cheryl set up a meeting with you. Yeah, just to bring me up to speed and then again, mm -hmm. just to see what steps need to be taken and, and who the people, the folks are that are involved. Because I understand, too, in, in a town, it's, it, you get, it gets political. And, we, you know, we want to make everybody you say make everyone happy about it. It's not possible, but you want to be careful. So, um, we can try to help navigate mm -hmm. that. And as a future resident of Boylston, yeah, you know, school myself, yeah, you know, get, right? I'm going to step in the wrong foot. Yeah. I'd like to step right. into the foot as a new taxpayer <laughs> on a good note. <laughs> So yeah, so I have to share all we've done and we'll figure out. And I'm also willing to help if it Thank you. is that he can know that it's I don't know. And then we good. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I know, Angela, you said that you are also going to be looking at some options in Berlin, too, to maybe bring forward. So that will be helpful as well if you see anything. Or, um, we talked about maybe talking with some of the people in Berlin, maybe yeah. the select board might know, or the planning board might know of some opportunities as well in Berlin. And we're open to wherever the school committee sees as an appropriate fit for us in central office. Um, maybe the appropriate fit is to stay there, but like I said, it's work that needs to be done. Um, we have to decide either we need to work on improving it or we have to get our office out. Thank you. That's it. Um, school committee comments or future agenda items. So at this point, oh yeah. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Just a question on the financial feasibility. It's have they started the process at this point and it's going to take them four months to come So what they've done is they met with us for about two hours today. Um, and we have another meeting again for um, two I've hours him, next week. I've sent him a lot of files. Yep. So he's requested a lot of information. So he's just going to start. And the chapter 70? The governor's budget tomorrow. comes out tomorrow. Tomorrow. So we'll have a so lot more information. He'll be able to start. With that. Right, and so what he's do, done is he's collected some initial work and he sat with uh, the three of us today for about two hours to really go through each of the seven points to make sure he sees where's our concerns or what would he like, what would we like him to investigate and, and get more in-depth information on, which I think was really helpful. We never got that on our first Mm -hmm. um, feasibility study, which was really great to hear, like, where are your concerns or where are, you, where are, you, where are your hopes, you know, those kind of things. Um, and then he'll be meeting with us again next week as well. And he said it would be about two hours that he would be spending on that, too, because between now and the governor's information coming out tomorrow, he'll be putting some potential calculations forward and to bring them to us and see if there's anything else that come up that we want to know about. They seem like they really know their staff. So oh, yeah. I was very impressed with meeting with them today. So. Yeah, and if any of you have an opportunity, um, I think, what did you say, March 1st was the Mars meeting that he's doing a training? Yes, on net school spending. Net school spending, he'll do a training. As school committee members of the regional school committee, you have a right to attend those meetings. We are members of Mars. Um, so if you decide that you want to go to a Mars meeting on March 1st, uh, Mark Abrams will, will be there doing the training. He does them every year um, for Mars, so, as well as MASBA. Is, is there any additional preliminary work we can be looking to do, setting timelines? I mean, I know the study has to happen before anything, but do we sit dormant? Or is there anything? I think you wait until you okay. see what he has, and then he'll come out and present it. Um, to you, and then I would sit. My recommendation would be 
um, that the committee listens and maybe asks some initial questions that you have, and then from that night, from that point, set up a time that you could have a workshop where your only topic is that audit. And you, you talk among yourselves and as your focal point. What what did you what was a surprise to you? What are you concerned with? What are your you know and think about what you're gonna do for your next steps as a committee. Let it go, say it's done, or you need to pursue, want to pursue, whatever you decide to do. Okay. But I would wait until you get the information. Okay. There's really nothing to do with that point until that point. So we'll need uh, each of the school committees to have a motion to adjourn. I have a motion to adjourn the regional meeting. So moved. Second. 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 Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Could I have a motion to adjourn the Boylston Elementary School committee? Second. All in favor? Aye. Do I did it. <laughs> Do I have a motion to close the Berlin School Committee? Yes. Motion made. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.